Good morning online. We are back for uh, week three, our final week of the Bible. And uh, this is a fun week as well, because now we get to take sort of uh, all we've talked about and kind of dig in again, how do, we, how do we use it? How do we approach it? And that's really what we're doing. Yeah. Week three, what we have done, we have talked about, uh, as we approach the Bible, we've talked about the origin of Scripture in week one. We've talked about the canon of Scripture in week two. We've talked about the manuscripts copying and translating of Scripture last week. This week, we want to talk about two parts, the authority and the use of Scripture. So when we talk about the authority of Scripture, we're really talking about four theological or biblical words that are thrown around a lot. That Scripture is inspired, it is inerrant, it is infallible, and it is, come up, I thought I pushed it, sufficient. So those are the four words we want to know to describe what the Scripture says. So we start with the idea of inspiration. How did it sort of come about? Well, let's let Scripture define what these words mean. So when we talk about inspiration, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction. Maybe we've seen that, right? The other chapter, the verse we looked at for inspiration is in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. This is not a man-made thing. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. It wasn't even man's thoughts. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I think this is probably one of the better verses for sort of describing or speaking to the inspiration of Scripture. I think sometimes while we were not there, I think that Scripture would say, and we see clearly that uh, God used the unique personalities. He used the unique particular times and places and circumstances. He used the unique audiences and experiences of the authors that were his uh, uh, vehicles, right? So it wasn't that uh, he put uh, Paul in a trance and all of a sudden the quill got up and started writing. Okay, that's not how it worked. Uh, it wasn't that he sort of uh, just sort of dictated and, and Paul had no idea what he was writing, that there was sort of a use of these times, but everything was perfectly inspired and breathed out by God. Not a man may will. Now, one of the things I'll speak about, too, with inspiration is we look at this and we're reading, um, whether it's Paul's writing or Peter's, and they're using the word scripture. What would they have been talking about? Old Testament. Old Testament. That's the scripture they knew. So they're talking about the Hebrew Bible. So what question might you have now? What about the New Testament? Is it the same? Did God speak and use the same thing? Say most definitely yes, and I think there's, there's the scriptural sort of speaking to that too. Second Peter 3.15 says, Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him, the same way in all his letters. So Peter's identifying, hey, I know you guys have been getting these letters from Paul. Know that that's from the wisdom of God. That's the inspiration of God. God is speaking through Paul. Even at that point, the recognition of the Gospels and the New Testament letters were seen as being inspired of God's wisdom as Scripture. Okay? So that's what's meant by the inspired Word of God. And we see this defined in Scripture. Okay? So inspiration. Secondly, inerrancy. Now this is the big one. I think this is really, really the big one. And we're going to talk about something that was sort of put together because of that. Inerrancy. The word we're going to see about inerrancy is truth, truthfulness. Scripture is, is just full of it, right? Every word of God proves true. There is no error. Psalm, the sum of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Truth forever. Every one of your inspired words. Further, sanctify them. New Testament, the gospel according to John. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Titus, say, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. So inerrancy is the idea that God's inspired word, which we now say is the canon of Scripture, is truthful forever because God does not lie. Okay, so inerrancy in all things. 
and everything it describes, okay? So, how important is inerrancy? Well, it is seen by many, and it hasn't just been in sort of our age. It's, you know, sort of really probably uh, for the last thousand years, and then, of course, through the Reformation and all, was, uh, is the idea of biblical inerrancy is really at the heart of uh, sort of, of, of our genuine, not just faith, but our genuine testimony, our witness. Uh, the authority of Scripture is rooted in the inerrancy of Scripture. It loses all authority when, there's, when it's not inerrant. And so in 1978, over 200 theologians, pastors, scholars got together, all denominations, um, and they got together. Uh, these were like uh, J.I. Pack Packer we talked about, R.C. Sproul, uh, Francis Schaeffer, James Boyce, who's done a lot of wonderful commentaries, um, John, uh, Johnny Mack. Um, all of them got together, and they looked at this idea of what biblical inerrancy was. You can go out there and read it. Look at the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. It's not long. It's basically five points. They call the short statement. And then 19, I think it's 19 articles of affirmation and denial that follow. And they're short. This isn't like heavy stuff. Okay. Um, the short statement speaks about, you know, God's authorship. It speaks about the divine inspiration, the truthfulness, and all that sort of thing. But what I really like is statement number five of the short statement. The short statement of number five says that the authority of Scripture is inescapably impaired if this total divine inerrancy is in any way limited or disregarded or made relative to a view of truth that is contrary to the Bible's own. When we talk about the authority of Scripture, it is grounded in the idea that um, it's, it's not changing. Okay, It's, it's not... Um, a, a truth that is dependent. It's not relative truth, right? It is, it is, is truthful then, now, and forever. So that's what inerrancy is. There's no errors. It's truthful. Okay. Now there's a word that's closely associated with inerrancy. Has anybody ever heard the other word? Infallibility. Yeah. Biblical infallibility. Um, we hear that word, I think if, um, if you're in the Roman Catholic Church, you've heard this word before. Uh, it has been described as uh, the actual pope being infallible. I think that's actually defined now as has been changed to actually his 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 uh, his comments or his doctrine on faith is only what's infallible. Nothing, not a life of infallibility. But that's changing. That's great, right? None of us are infallible, honestly, right? But the Bible is infallible. So infallibility of Scripture is so closely tied to inerrancy. Basically, what it means is if we think of inerrancy as being truthfulness, there are no errors. The original autographs. God's spoken word, breathed out, contains no errors. Infallibility simply m means uh, it contains no errors because it can't possibly be filled with errors. It's perfect in all things. There can be no errors because we serve an infallible God, and he has an infallible word. It, does, it can't contradict itself. It's trustworthy in all things. It's a perfected word and a perfect author. So in matters of faith, in matters of place, in matters of history, um, it is an infallible author providing a word that cannot contradict itself, and therefore it is without error. Does that make sense? It can't fail us. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way. That's a, it can't fail us. It's infallible. Um, we cannot fall. So those are the two words that often are associated with biblical authority. It's inerrant without errors. It's infallible, well, because it just can't produce errors. It's impossible. It can't contradict itself. All of, the, all of the positions of attempting, I mean, the Bible, as we've seen, has been around for a long time. Uh, and even in its imperfect form, for which we have ways of going back and, and testing and finding, um, miraculously, to the original words, um, many attempts have been made to prove contradictions. It hasn't been proven to contradict itself, because it can't, okay? So that's where we get the authority of Scripture. That's why it's an authoritative tool or authoritative word on our lives, which brings us to that last word, which I love and we don't use nearly enough, is that the Bible is sufficient. There is a sufficiency of Scripture that makes it authoritative, meaning that the Word of God is sufficient for the knowledge of salvation and to a life of faith. 
I like Psalm 19. You know, the Psalm 19 talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God, right? That the sky proclaims his handiwork. We can see that God exists in the world around us through his creation, okay? But it's through his word, the psalmist would go on to say, 711, the law of the word, perfect and sure, that's what makes the wise, that's what makes wise the simple. That's what enlightens the eyes. Then he goes on to say it's sweeter than honey because of that. That's pretty good. I like that. So we see God exist, but through the word, we now have the, the word that tells us the knowledge of who he is, his salvation, and how we can live. So that's, that's the sufficiency of scripture. We see it in a couple of verses, I think. We're, this is our theme really for the year here. Not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. That's what God's word through the gospel revelation is from start to finish. It's sufficient for us to understand and know salvation. The, the second part of that 2 Timothy chapter 3 goes on to say, so that the man of God, woman of God, child of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. That's what makes the Bible authoritative over anything else we can read or teach or listen to. Sufficient. So that's a pretty awesome one too. Everything we need right there. So, inerrancy, infallibility, sufficiency, inspiration. That gives the Bible authority. Now, what do we do with it? We know where it's come from. We know it's, how it's got to us. We understand its authority. What do we actually do? And I want to give you in the last few minutes we've got, last 15 minutes here, six keys. Now, these are just, these are, Dave's keys. <laughs> they're, they're not, uh, we're not presuming they're the best or the only keys. Uh, that you may have your own personal keys to reading the Bible and utilizing the Bible that work better than these six, but I think these are really important on how we use, interpret, understand, apply Scripture. Okay? Number one, um, this one is not original to me, uh, but I, I have taken it from Fee and Stewart and, every, and, and a lot of others too, but I think this is so important. The Bible was written for us, was not written to us. The Bible was written for us, it was not written to us. The Bible was written to a specific people at a specific time, speaking into specific circumstances. When we start with this idea first, what we're saying is, you know what, for me to even interpret what's going on here, I really need to sort of get into the lens of who it was written to. Okay, it's a little bit about context, but it's more about walking in the sandals. It allows me not to interpret it in a way that is a 21st century American interpretation. Applied, absolutely. Truthful. Then, now, and forever. All right? it, was, um, it doesn't make it any less relevant. It doesn't make it any less um, applicable or intentional. And so, Scripture cannot mean today what it did not mean to the original audience. Otherwise, we are definitely putting a 21st century American lens onto it, and we're changing its meaning. Again, it will be applied differently because we live different lives at different times and different people. But it cannot mean uh, anything that is different uh, than what it was when it was written. So, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. We see Paul writing to the Corinthians. He says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Glorify God with your body. No matter how many fitness programs, diet plans, self-help books that we write, that passage will never mean anything about our physical body. Other than be careful of sexual immorality. It has nothing to do with the shape or the condition or the health of our physical body. It was never intended to be. Paul says, look what you're doing with the prostitutes. Don't you know that the Holy Spirit indwells you? You are now joining together the Holy Spirit and the flesh. Glorify God with your body. This takes on a deeper meaning later when we look at context, because if we think about biblical theology, which I love this idea of biblical theology being about the tabernacle or the temple of God, 
We tabernacle. Tabernacle means to dwell with. It's talking about the presence. In the garden, we dwelled with God. There was that tabernacle, that, that temple. And then, um, then we actually had uh, this sort of tent of meeting that he established with Moses in the Exodus. And then we actually build a tabernacle for God, and, he, and that's where his presence is, right? And then he comes, and he tap, Scripture says he tabernacled with them. Jesus dwelled with them. And then on Pentecost, he gave the Holy Spirit in order that we might be a tabernacle for his presence. The Bible is a theology about God's presence with, with his creation. This verse is about not defiling that presence. It has nothing to do... If it helps you eat fewer donuts, fine. If it helps you go run a mile, fine. But don't ever say or think that that's what that meant. That's what I mean by that. Does that make sense? That's, this is what, I mean, we have so much richness here. We just got to begin with the idea that, oh, this is for us, God. Thank you for writing this for us. I do recall Paul's not writing to me, though. Let me understand what he was actually writing into. Okay, number one rule. Number two, context, context, context. Um, I know you guys, we, we all, I think every believer wants to be, be something beyond a bumper sticker Christian, right? So if we really want to know, we've got to get into the context. And there's three contexts I, want, I like to think about. There's the idea of historical context. What's going on between the Romans and the, the Jews? You know, who's, who's the emperor and what did that mean? And the Bible's filled again with names and places. And what's the context historically of what's happening at that point, right? That's critical. Cultural context is more critical to our understanding of Scripture. Jesus says that he is the bread of life. All right? Kind of thinking back to rule number one, if I think about that today, what I think about the bread is being sort of that basket that comes at the first of the dinner, right? You want a couple of rolls with this meal? Right? Eh, I'll take it. I'll, you know, I'm, uh, again, a lot of us, maybe, I'm gluten-free. I don't eat bread. I'm on a low-carb diet. Forget the bread. It must not be that important. All right? Culturally, context, this was subsistence. This was the actual nourishment of the day. This was 90% of everything I ate was bread. Jesus says you can't live unless you have bread. That's pretty good, right? I mean, that's powerful. That's stepping back and saying, oh, now that I understand the culture, this is very impactful. I don't treat Jesus like the beforehand dinner roll right? A couple of pieces of toast, whatever it might be. I treat him as this is, I mean, he's all I'm living on. If I don't feed and eat from the nourishment of Jesus, I've lost the whole meaning of Jesus is the bread of life. Cultural. All right. Thirdly, scriptural context is most critical. You know, there's some general rules to this. Um, every time you read a verse, always make sure you read the verse on either side of it, even if you hadn't attended to. Anytime you read a passage, read the passage on either side of it, even though you didn't intend to. Um, anytime, you know, you read where it is in the book, right? Uh, just sort of read the other side of it. So we have to know scriptural context. Um, Philippians 4.13, again, this is all scriptural context right there. This is bumper sticker. This is coffee mug t-shirt stuff, right? The scriptural context, what's Paul going through, Right? I have, he, he moves into this whole passage that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me by speaking of the, those things. It's not in a vacuum. This isn't I can do all things, everything. This is I can suffer, I can experience joy and sorrow, I can experience a lot and a little. And it's a transition because I can do these things through Christ who strengthens me. So, scriptural context. I hope that... History is great. Culture is greater. <laughs> Scripture is greatest, if that works. Okay. Third, the Bible is a literary work. I think when we realize this rule and this key to reading the Bible, we start to see the beauty of God's work. We start to see the literary uh, just brilliance. We start to say, wow, this is happening here, but it's because of what happened here. That's beautiful. That's incredible. It's a library, right? The Bible is a literary work. The Holy Spirit through those 40 plus author, authors unified, uh, a, a unified whole of Scripture uh, has put this work together. So you don't have to be an expert at this. You may forget that we ever even talked about this, but you should know that within Scripture, there are actual literary devices from that specific time and place 
that create the beauty of Scripture. There's things called chiasm. So when we look in some of the Old Testament, chiasm was a literary device that if you think about me saying something and I label it A, and then I say something else and I label it B, and I say something else and I label it C, I'm going to then walk back out there and I'm going to say that same B again, and then I'm going to say that same A again. So if you ever did any like outlining in, in literature or poetry, it's like an A, B, C, B, A. Intentional. And if we read it on the surface, we're like, what's going on here? That's kind of crazy. Well, it was an intentional device that God's using through to just sort of put the beauty in this. Right? Chronological order. Most ancients could care less. We love chronological order. I mean, it's what pervenes order. When we're reading it, we like to know that we were born, went to school, got married, had a job, and we died. Let's, and you can tell the story. Tell it in that order. It didn't matter. It didn't matter to most ancients, even up through the first century. I could be telling you something and I'll go back three years and just insert it without ever telling you I went back. Lack of chronological order is also a very distinguishable uh, aspect of literary work at that time. Repetition, um, we have to know that it's there for a purpose and an emphasis. The creation story, right? Genesis 1, when we look at verse 27, we see he created man and woman. Then we get to chapter 2. And we see that he created man and he goes to creation again. Is that two creations? He doesn't ever say, you know, Moses and through God's writing never even says, well, let me tell you again about what happened. So what's going on? Emphasis. Emphasis is going on. Genesis 1 is about the creation order. Genesis 2 is about the relationship of his creation. Very intentional. And we see that happen a lot, again, in the Old Testament. We see a lot of things, and you're reading, and you'll say, wait, he just wrote that. Is this another guy named Jacob? <laughs> so, no, 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 that was the emphasis and the purpose of repetition. Widely used literary device. And multiple genres, this is one I like. Um, you know, there are at least seven distinguishable genres within Scripture. One of your handout I'll show here in a minute uh, kind of helps you see what those are. But um, most of us don't realize that almost a third of the Bible is actually a poetry genre. Right? We look at Psalms, it's okay. It's, you know, maybe Ecclesiastes or something. Um, but um, even through Moses' work, there's a lot of poetry in Moses. Jeremiah. There's, a, there's in certain, New Testament, there's poetry that'll surprise you. Um, so, that's important because when you go and you pick up a, a, a poetry book or a fiction book or a nonfiction or a bio or um, uh, apocalyptic, you know, John, you sort of have to understand what's being written and how that's presented. This is the handout, one of the handouts on one of the sides this week. I, I like this sort of uh, periodic table of the Bible because it kind of breaks it into both genres. If you're learning the Old Testament, it's an easy way of looking at uh, the, the, the Torah, the law, and then the history books and wisdom books that are in that blue, uh, I always like to ask people, do you know why Lamentations is ordered after Jeremiah, even though it's sort of a, it's a wisdom book? Because Jeremiah wrote it. Uh, in sort of putting the English Bible canon together, the emphasis was keeping the two Jeremiah books to get together, even though trying to keep the genres together elsewhere. Um, in an ideal world, the Hebrew Bible that has the wisdom books together, Lamentations would be separated from Jeremiah. Just a little. That, that's a freebie. No extra charge for admission on that side. Uh, all right. Number four. We talked about this last week. Chapters and verses were added much later. Okay? Just knowing that's good enough. You don't have the details, the Latin Vulgate. When we're saying much later, we're talking 1,200, 1,300 years. Uh, we talked about the Hebrew Bible had also about 1,300, a different numbering system. The reason I mention that is because I think it sometimes is very good to get out of the chapter verse sort of model of reading. There are many readers versions. ESV has a wonderful ESV readers version uh, that actually there's five books and they're sort of by five major areas. Uh, the Gospels and Acts, the letters, uh, the law, history, and then the prophets. And there are no chapters, no verses. Basically just as, as you would have received it at that time. And the reason that's good sometimes is because we get into this preconceived kind of, oh, I need to stop right there. Or some, if that's verse 13 and the new chapter starts, that must not have anything to do with it. And it's just a continuation. In some cases, we'll look at verses and even today say, that wasn't a great place to put a verse, number. Really should have continued on. So pick up a reader's version. Sometimes. If you're looking online, just say, hey, don't show me any of the numbers. Just, or the subtitles, the headings that we sometimes, you know, Jesus feeds. Um, 
th those were all inserted, obviously, too. Okay, so sometimes it's good just to read it without any of that other. Um, just a thought. Uh, number five, the Bible is purposed. Every word, instruction, story, parable, vision, conversation is purposed to be part of God's unified whole, the plan of redemption from, you know, the one-story garden of Genesis through the one-story new garden of Revelation. It's purposed, but even more so, anytime you look at Scripture, you're reading a passage, I would advise you, I would encourage you to look for two things in every passage that it's purposed for. Number one, the revelation of who God is. God's character from Genesis to Revelation. And number two, the revelation of our response knowing His character. That's when we're really reading Scripture. Wherever we are, we say, God, I, I've, I've seen this about you in this passage. This is really what you've now having me respond in this way or live out or act that way. Sufficiency, right? Sufficiency in every passion. It's purpose for that. That's, that's the, to me, and there's probably better ways of saying it. Again, to me, the Bible's purpose is to reveal the, the unified whole of redemption and to reveal God's character and our response. That's it. That's why, that's, that's the word of God to us. That's what we, how we approach it. A good way of thought. And then finally, and I've got just a couple passages here, reading of scripture, looking for scripture to equip us, sustain us, and strengthen us. And I think about just a, a few passages, um, you know, Psalm 1 is wonderful, you know, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of wicked, where do you get your authority? Not in the counsel of the world. Don't stand in the way of sinners for that authority or sit in the seat of scoffers, but delight in the law of the Lord. And on the law, he meditates day and night. Authority. That's blessedness. Joshua 1.8 says, The book of the law, God's word, shall not depart from my mouth. Meditate it on a day and night. You may, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Sufficiency. Authority. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This isn't a promise of worldly prosperity. This is a promise of eternal glory. This is a promise of, of worldly peace and joy. That's prosperity and success. A promise of knowing the way of salvation and a promise of the life of faith. Right there in Scripture. Hebrews 4.12. This is one we maybe some of us heard. For the Word of God is living and active. Right? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Scripture will reveal those areas that we need to probably make adjustments. It will re reveal those areas that are blind spots to us. It will reveal those areas where we need to um, be um, you know, anxious to listen and, and, and less likely to talk and be kind. and compassion. All of these things of our living out our faith Scripture is very sharp at saying, ah, ah. right? So when we're reading Scripture, the strengthening, the meditating on it, but also the Lord, show me in your character and my response, what's my changed behavior? How am I transformed from now what you just showed me about yourself and what I should, how I should respond? I always say this, and I hope I, hope I say it in... in um, with a qualifier that you know what I'm talking about. The message of the gospel is a simple message. Who Jesus is, what he did, uh, our ability to confess that, receive him as Lord and Savior. The assurance of salvation is a simple message. The study and growth and sanctification of our walk is a discipline that should be very challenging. It should be, I always say, when you spend some time in Scripture, and maybe it's, it's a, a one setting, or maybe it's for a week, or maybe as we go through Romans starting in February, it, we should feel worn out. We should just leave it all on the field. Right? Now I'm getting coach talk. Right? <laughs> we should, it should be 120%. Right? That's, that's what Bible, and, um, but it's always, the, the climb is always worth, the, the view is always worth the climb. Right? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So, again, high level, we've covered a lot, just like we did with you know, church history and all, but I hope high level there are some, some things that resonate and stick with you. Um,
had just a couple of minutes, so I don't know if there's any uh, questions or thoughts, or we'll close in prayer and we can start. Yeah. So the the question is, um, you know, all of this is uh, we ourselves are not in a vacuum. That um, what about reading it and, and growing in it and, and sort of fulfilling the authoritative nature of it as a fellowship or a cooperative aspect? Absolutely. I mean, I think we see the testimony of Scripture. Uh, think about any time we see sort of the reading of the Scriptures, it was the coming together, right? Now, there was a necessary means for that, but there was an emphasis on the idea that uh, we were reading the Scriptures together, we were praying and singing the hymns. And so, you know, don't stop meeting together. And so Scripture study uh, and, and Scripture reading, even in itself, meditation, I, I truly believe is the biblical model as well. Absolutely. The, the idea of kind of a personal time in Scripture is almost a luxury for most of us today that hasn't been there many times in the church. That uh, it's really the idea of our coming together, not just to draw strength and encouragement, but also to, um, to sort of prevent uh, bad interpretations to allow each of us to sort of speak through, oh, no, in context, Scripture's saying that. So, um, if, yeah, absolutely, sort of, if there's like a yes <laughs> to answer to your question, I, I think that's, that's definitely the call of Scripture. And, um, you know, I think that's the call of just like one-on-one -on -one accountability. Let's get together and let's just go through this passage or this book. That's the call of why we do church-wide, is so that we're all aligned in the context and the application and the meaning, and that we have uh, these conversations about it. Um, if we're truly following this scripture aspect of, um, uh, you know, those, those last verses that talked about day and night and meditating in it and all that, it's, it's really being consumed with God's word in order that we may know him better and love him more. We'll right. pray. I'll pray and we'll close, close out this Bible series. Lord, we're so grateful that you have given us the